everyone. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm Fabiana Bacchini, Executive Director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. CPBF is a charitable organization, and our mission is to support and educate families of premature babies. This premium chat series is one of the many initiatives we have to bring information for NICU families and healthcare professionals. Here every Friday, we talk with experts, researchers, and parents who share with us their experience and knowledge. Also on our website, canadianpremies.org, parents will find all kinds of support and resource, such as the COVID care program. CPBF is offering four free therapy sessions for families who are currently in an ICU or up to a year positive discharge. To register for that program, you can go to canadianpremies.org and fill up the form and somebody from our organization will be in touch with you. And today we are going to talk about preterm birth and adult health. In this session, we are going to discuss the link between preterm birth and the risk of chronic health diseases. This knowledge is important to identify risk factors and early signs of, the, of disease, so preventative and therapeutic interventions can be implemented to improve health. Today's presentation will focus on finding uh, findings regarding long-term health of young adults born preterm, and on how patients, families, and clinicians can advocate to improve health monitoring in adolescence and adulthood. And I have here joined me live from Montreal. Let me bring them to the stream. And Camille and Dr. Lou. So I have Dr. Anne-Monique Nui, who is a senior cl clinician scientist at St. Justin and professor of pediatrics at the University of Montreal. Dr. Nui's research team studies hypertension and cardiovascular diseases in children and adults who are born preterm. Her translational research program spans from experimental animal work to clinical as well as epidemiological studies. She's currently the head of the Department of Pediatrics at St. Justin and chair of CIHR Institute for Human Development, Child and Youth Health Advisory Board. Also joining us, uh, Dr. Lu, who is a pediatrician, medical director of St. Justin's neonatal follow-up program and associate clinical professor of pediatrics at the University of Montreal. She's a clinical research scholar from the Quebec Health Research Funds. Uh, her research focuses on long-term neurodevelopmental and physical health outcomes following preterm birth from infancy to adulthood, <laughs> looking at risk and resilience factors along with best screening strategies to enhance clinical follow-up. She's also the director of the Canadian Neonatal Follow-Up Network, a research network including the 26 neonatal follow-up programs across Canada, and last but not least, Camille Girard Bock, who was born at 26 weeks of gestation at Saint Justin, weighing only 920 grams, and spent three months in the hospital. She's now completing a PhD on the consequences of preterm birth on adult health with a focus on cardiovascular health. She also coordinates the patient advisory board for the health of adult preterm investigation project ensuring a partnership between researchers and young adults born preterm. What a pleasure to have all three of you here today. It is indeed a dream team with research, clinician, and an adult who was born preterm involved in this field as well. I'm so grateful uh, to have you all here today. Thank you. So we are Fabiana. Thank you. So Camille, I know you're going to start this presentation. You can start sharing your screen. And for all of you watching us live from YouTube or Facebook, you can send your comments, your questions, and we're going to be addressing at the end of the presentation. Let me just put the presentation here. Camille, you have the stage. Hello, everyone. So I am happy to be here today to present the first part of this presentation and share a bit of my own experience with prematurity at the same time. So as uh, Fabiana said, uh, almost 30 years ago, my mom gave birth to me in July and I was supposed to be born in October. So I was born at 26 weeks um, and I spent three months in the hospital. I had a bronchopulmonary dysplasia due to the additional oxygen that I needed uh, during my stay, which is uh, what we see on the 
the picture on the left here, I had this uh, plastic bag on my head, which is how they gave me the oxygen at the time. So fortunately, uh, during my childhood, I never felt any limitation due to my prematurity. However, my parents didn't know what to expect for the future because they kept receiving recruitment letters uh, for studies long after my last medical appointment. So they were wondering, what are these researchers looking for? Like, is there still something that could go wrong uh, this long after uh, my birth? So <clears throat> we received no information on, on this, but as you can see here on the picture on the, on the left, uh, it's me at the science fair in high school. So I was doing a presentation on preterm birth. So I was, uh, I was curious and I wanted to know more. So many years later, here I, here I am. So I'm completing a PhD on the long-term effect of preterm birth on cardiovascular health. I also started med school last fall. And importantly, as a PhD student at Shu Saint Justin, I'm also working on making sure that we go and get input from individuals who were born preterm to ensure that the research that we do aligns uh, with their best interest. And this is the patient advisory board. So actually, the way that I discovered Dr. Nguyen and Dr. Lu's lab before starting my PhD is that I was recruited as a participant in the HAPI study, that is a study on the health of young adults born preterm. So this study would help identify factors to be, that could be modified in order to improve health in this population. Uh, the team recruited more than 100 young adults that were born preterm, 105 full-term born controls that were all between uh, 18 and 29 years old at the time. On the day of the visit, it was a whole day of testing starting, I think, at 7 in the morning. So we uh, filled many forms. Uh, there were many measurements taken, uh, cardiac, renal ultrasound, uh, DEXA scan to check our bones, uh, bl blood tests, in including a glucose tolerance test where we had to drink this uh, uh, orange uh, juice that is very sweet that is on the on the picture here um, and um, we had uh, pulmonary testing uh, exercise test on a bicycle and then we had to go home with a blood pressure cuff that would inflate every 20 minutes for 24 hours so it was quite something and I think that uh, many of us participated in that study uh, to contribute to research and uh, kind of get, give back to the hospital that uh, saved our lives and maybe with the hope also that the result of the study could help uh, making sure that the ones that came after us would get uh, kind of um, the kind of health recommendations that we, we, we wish we had received. So what to do when we reach adulthood. So uh, I will uh, continue. Thank you, Camille, for uh, while well describing the happy study. So why is it important to study health of adults who were born preterm when we all know that preterm birth occurs at a very special time of development at a time of organ uh, development and uh, so that we know the lungs, but the brain as well as the heart, the kidneys, the bones are in active uh, development. They're still uh, getting new cells and new vessels and so that uh, we wondered whether preterm birth could have an impact on these uh, organs and therefore um, change a little bit the function uh, throughout childhood and adulthood. And so that we thought it was important to understand what could happen over time and over the long term and in order to help us promote good health and avoid disease uh, in uh, children and, and adults who were born preterm. Next slide. Because uh, right now, with the progress of, of medicine, as well as obstetrical care, uh, we know that the vast, vast majority of even the smallest babies survive, so that now the challenge is not so much survival, but making sure that we go on with the disease-free survival. As we can see on these, um, uh, this article that was published in Nature uh, last year, 2020, um, describing all the progress that are made in this field we're talking to you about, understanding the health of adults who were born preterm. And I want to underline here the beautiful pictures that the photographer Red Method took of children and adults holding their own baby picture. Um, you can see those on his website. Next slide. 
So what have we found with uh, our study? And thanks to uh, Camille, who has organized all these little cartoons, we're going to go through these organs uh, together. Next slide. So what about blood pressure? Well, we found that in our cohort uh, of young adults born preterm, blood pressure is higher in uh, those who were born preterm compared to those who were born term. However, it is still within the normal range on average. We can, you know, blood pressure has two numbers, the high number and the low number, so systolic and diastolic, diastolic being the low number. And you can see that the um, in the green on the graphs is what is normal range, <clears throat> yellow is, well, not normal, and red is uh, definitely abnormal, here, uh, hypertension, all the graphs will be uh, displayed the same way. So the full term uh, average values that we found are in the uh, dot, and the uh, average values that we found for the preterm group are represented by the little star. So you can see that the values of blood pressure of the individual's bone preterm are a little higher, uh, however, they're still within a normal limit. What, however, struck us is that uh, nearly 40% of the preterm group had some values that were reaching hypertension level versus 18% of the ones who were born um, at term. So it's not that the term had zero hypertension. We still find hypertension in those who were born at term, but we saw it more often in those who were born preterm. Next slide. Uh, so why is blood pressure a little higher? There could be many reasons that we have uh, examined here and uh, other groups around the world are looking at this. Well, uh, we saw that the vessel size, the vessels were a little uh, smaller and we can imagine that pressure is higher in a smaller vessel and also the vessels are a little stiffer. Uh, so they're more rigid. So the pressure rises more ra um, uh, easily. Uh, we also saw that the kidneys were a little smaller in the individuals born uh, preterm. And we all know that kidney has something to do with uh, higher blood pressure. And indeed, those who had the smallest kidneys were the ones with the highest blood pressure. The heart is not causing high blood pressure, but it's important to know also that the heart is functioning well, but its size is a little smaller as well, as, it, as if, if the growth had been a little halted or um, impeach a little bit. Therefore, um, but the function of the heart uh, is normal. But these are elements that tell us that we have to be cautious and maintain blood pressure as much as possible within normal range to ensure health of the vessels of the heart remain excellent. What we also know, um, observed in our studies was that in women, when it was time for them to uh, have babies. So women born preterm themselves, when they had babies, we saw that more often they had hypertension of pregnancy, preeclampsia, as well as gestational diabetes. I didn't write that here. Uh, we also know that uh, from studies out of Sweden, that in uh, individuals born uh, preterm uh, up to 45 years ago, they have higher rates of uh, cardiac problems. So in young adults around the age of 23 years of age, when we saw them, heart is fine, uh, but blood pressure is a little higher. And uh, when women become pregnant, we have to be careful with the um, hypertension of pregnancy. And in the long term, we do see a little bit more of heart disease. Next slide, please. Uh, the lungs. We hear a lot about the lungs when the babies are in our uh, NICU. Uh, what's going on in the long term? Well, um, uh, parents of uh, children, young children who are born preterm know that they cough a little more often. They have symptoms that doctors call uh, asthma. And when we do lung tests in the young adults, even if we they're not complaining of any um, uh, lung problems, we do see that they still have some little changes uh, suggesting we say obstruction of their airways, which could resemble indeed uh, asthma. And they also report that their exercise tolerance is a little lower than the other, uh, than their friends, uh, for example. Uh, this is what we see here in the uh, little uh, picture of the lungs. 40% um, of uh, the uh, young adults who uh, did the test had some, what we call airflow limitation, 
uh, compared to 16% of those born at term. And you can see the little graph on the right. So, every, so the average uh, measures of the group were within normal limit, but we can see a clear trend that preterm, the little star who were born without uh, bronchopulmonary dysplasia were a little bit lower than those born at term who are represented by the dot. And it was, um, in fact, probably not surprising to see that the young adults who had had bronchopulmonary dysplasia, their uh, pulmonary function was uh, further a little lower, even though on average uh, with the normal limit. Uh, next slide, please. We also looked at the bones. Um, uh, and we did see that uh, bone mineral density was reduced in those young adults born preterm. Uh, but again, here you can see in the green that uh, all those densities are uh, within normal limit, but it's a little lower. Um, the studies so far have not reported that they break their bones more often when they play sport or just uh, uh, normal uh, children live. Um, but uh, we think it's important to remember this and make sure that we get enough calcium and vitamin D as uh, we go into adulthood, children and uh, childhood and adulthood. Next slide, please. Uh, we did, as uh, Camille described, many, many uh, tests and we're not the only ones. There are other groups around the world who are uh, carrying similar studies and overall we all um, find about the same thing. So I mentioned high blood pressure, um, bone density a little lower, lung function. What about the risk for diabetes, the sugar level in the blood? The sugar level in the blood is normal, but we, when we give the load, the orange juice, very sweet orange juice, as during pregnancy, um, it's the same test than the women do when they're looking for uh, pregnancy-associated diabetes. So we drink a, a big sugar load, and then we measure the sugar in the blood. And we saw that the sugar in the blood of those born preterm would go a little higher than those born terms, which means there's some risk of um, developing diabetes later in life. And in these um, others, I found uh, similar, uh, similar things. Um, lipids, so um, fat in the blood, cholesterol in our cohort, it was normal. We were very happy to see that. About half the studies find it's normal, half the studies find it's a little higher, but this does not seem to be a major problem for individuals born preterm. Body mass index, this means uh, are they uh, having overweight or not? In fact, in our cohort, uh, the preterm were, not, were, were um, not more overweight than the ones born term. And uh, there are other studies around the world who did find a little bit uh, of uh, higher rates of uh, overweight in individual born preterm, but this is not what we see. It is possible as well that the more premature the child was, um, the less the risk of having overweight, but we're not sure yet. One thing that struck us was that we found that 25% of our young adults born preterm were smoking. We were nearly devastated to see this. And it was the same rate as their friends. Well, no surprise, they do the same as their friends. But in terms of um, thinking about, uh, about uh, what they went through in the NICU with their fragile lungs, and that 20 years later, one in four is smoking, is really, really not a good idea. Next slide, please. So I will take over from here. So should we be concerned? So what's reassuring, as um, Anne-Monique said, is that still, when we saw the patients in their 20s, most functions, most functions were still within the normal range, which is a good thing. And the goal is to keep it this way. However, however, what is the normal history in general? So on the left-hand side, where, where there's the cartoon with the lungs, you see a uh, lung function in general and how it evolves over time. So usually between zero to 20, our lung function increase, and then it just goes downward and that's natural history. So the line above is what 
what would be a full term, uh, an individual born full term would have. So we know that for the premature babies who had uh, arrested development uh, of their lungs because of preterm birth, or maybe had additional injury because of the oxygen, the ventilators, the infections, their lung function is starts lower and goes a little bit lower when they reach adulthood. So our concern is that with time, as they get older and lung function decline, our concern is that they start having symptoms at an earlier age than if they had been born full term. So what we want to avoid is any additional stressor that could make it worse. One of the stressor is, for example, smoking. And we know that people who smoke will have faster decline of lung function. So is it going to be accelerated in the preterm population? This is something that we don't know yet, but we certainly want to avoid. On the right hand side, you'll see the cartoon with the bones. It's the same thing with the bones. Peak bone mass is going to be achieved somewhere around the 30s, and then it will go downward a little bit more for ladies than uh, for men. So for premature babies, it's the same thing. When they reach adulthood, bone mineral density will be lower. So what we don't want is this, low, this bone mass to be actually decreasing faster when they reach an age where we are at higher risk of osteopenia and osteoporosis and have higher risk of fracture. So knowing that, this is where actually we can do something, you can do something to really optimize your function in young adulthood. Next slide. First, what are the risk and protective factors? So for hypertension, we know that there are certain conditions, I guess at this stage, that can't be really changed. I mean, if you were born to, to a, a preeclamptic pregnancy, you know, that happened and it's just like this. And same thing, if you had gest gestational diabetes, uh, you're more at risk later on as the baby to, to have hypertension. But knowing that maybe patients who are born to pregnancies complicated by diabetes or preclamps, that probably needs more follow-up to make sure that they don't develop hypertension. And if they do, that treatment can be started early. What has been shown to be protective, maybe not directly for hypertension, but more for cardiac health is breast milk. Uh, and for kangaroo care, it has not proven yet that it, it has beneficial effect on overall health, but we know that in terms of child behavior and behavior in general, it does have an effect up to 20 years. We still wanted to mention it here. How about like in infancy and childhood, any uh, risk or protective factors? We know that excessive weight gain after 18 months of age, as for any children, has add to uh, uh, is an additional risk factor for premature babies. But sometimes I know for clinicians, we worry if from discharge from the NICU up to 18 months to 24 months, if the child has too much catch up weight gain, is that a problem? So far, studies have shown that there's no association. So really, like from zero to 18 months, the best is really to have optimal weight gain. But afterwards, to have excessive weight gain really doesn't add any benefit. Next slide. It's the same idea for glucose intolerance and diabetes. So risk factors during the perinatal period, we know that children with intrauterine growth restriction or low birth weight are a little bit at a higher risk. But in infancy and childhood, once again, excessive weight gain that would be an indicator of overweight and obesity might be an additional risk factors for premature babies. And low lean body mass, which means that the muscle mass is uh, decreased, is also a risk factors. So those are things that can be actually modified or optimized through exercise and healthy eating. Next slide. And for respiratory health, Monica has already shown that children who, who have bronchopulmonary dysplasia tend to have lower lung function. And children who are exposed to cigarette smoke, there has been one study uh, so far in Australia following children over time. And those exposed to cigarette smoke um, who were born premature tends to have faster decline in lung function. And once again, this is something on which we can certainly act. Next slide. So what can we do to improve outcomes? And I like to take a live course approach. And so if you look on the, on the, pink, um, the pink column, there's the timeline where we look at parental health. So there's different time in life, parental health, there's the 
pregnancy, there's the preterm birth and the stay in the NICU, and then you have infancy through adulthood. But we have to remember, though, that those infants who become young adults will then become parents. So if we improve health during infancy and adulthood, we're actually already working to improve parental health and, once again, pregnancy. And that's just like a cycle that goes, uh, that goes around. So what are the goals? While some we can do some, it, I guess it belongs to researchers. So reduce preterm birth. There are researchers doing that and we'll leave it for them. Optimize, or, optimize organ development. Um, that's really the role of the neonatologist, the obstetrician, to really make sure that we, they can avoid any additional organ injury based on the treatment that they're giving in the NICU. But what we can do as a pediatrician and as parents is really to avoid the secondary hits or to anything that would accelerate decline in function. And so this is all the preventative measures that you can do that we as pediatrician can also uh, guide you uh, through. And this is not very original what I'm going to say, but it really goes back to the basic. Healthy eating, exercise, avoiding, um, avoiding uh, tobacco exposure. So if we look um, on the box in, in blue on the right lower corner, when we're talking about long-term follow-up, we want to prevent respiratory infection, so that goes with immunization hygiene, because children who had multiple infection might have lower lung function. That has not been completely well, um, well demonstrated, but it makes sense, and it's certainly something that is preventable. Um, avoid nephrotoxic exposure. And when it said that the, the, the kidneys were a little bit smaller, um, and that is linked to higher blood pressure. So nephrotoxic exposures, those are medications such as Advil or ibuprofen, which, which we know can have some impact uh, on the kidney. I think like taking one Advil once in a while is not a problem, but taking it regularly, maybe switching for something that has less uh, kidney effect can be easy to do. For example, switching for acetaminophen or Tylenol. So once again, like, Exposure once in a while, it's not a problem, but if we take it chronically, maybe that's not a good option and it needs to be discussed with the doctor. And once again, as I said, promote healthy lifestyle habits, and that really starts in infancy. So if you can implement it right when the, the child is small, this is going to be much easier as a teenager and as a young adult. And decreasing tobacco, tobacco smoke exposure, um, that's also like a great gift that you can give to your child. You will be like breastfeeding, you've been through the NICU and it's it's a lot. And maybe like the next gift that you, you can give if you're a smoker is really to seek for help through an uh, organized program and see if um, you can stop smoking. Because we know that parents who are smoking, the children will also be more likely to be smokers as adults. And afterwards, annual checkup. Often what happens is uh, you have great follow-up during the pediatric years and then for some reason in as teenagers and young adults, there's no more medical follow-up. But this is important really to make sure uh, that blood pressure is okay, monitor once in a while glucose and lipids. And so if something happens, there's actually an intervention that can be done. And if we have like a healthy adult, as we say, actually that that's going to be a healthy parent. And I was saying that reducing preterm birth, that, you know, that's for researcher, but actually we know that um, adults who are in good health have reduced risk of uh, premature of giving a uh, preterm birth. So this is not, that does not explain everything, but it can certainly uh, help. And so next slide. So to conclude, and the key messages we uh, want you to get from here is that preterm birth occurs during an important period of organ development. So we always think about the brain, but as Anne-Monique said, there's also the heart, the vessels, the lungs, the bones, the kidneys. So those are immature organs and they come out, uh, they were, they come in, in the world where they were not so ready. So it does have an effect and we have to make sure that we optimize their growth afterwards. So it is, we know that preterm birth is associated with an increased risk of chronic health conditions, but using a life course approach, I really think that families and caregivers are well positioned to change positively this trajectory and to make sure that 
the individuals born preterm can have the most optimal health. So we, we really wanted to give this talk today and we thank uh, Fabiana for inviting us with uh, not to say that, you know, not to give a panicky message. Um, I think the goal here is really like, there's something that can be done. And this is what Camille has taught us throughout this project is fine. Like you have those findings, there's something that can be done now. Don't keep th those findings just for you. We have to tell people because it's not complicated to get your blood pressure checked. It's not complicated to, to modify your diet. Well, I mean, it's complicated, but <laughs> it's feasible. So uh, this is really the message we, we would uh, love to get through. And actually, like, I would really thank Camille for, um, for pushing us to uh, go to, uh, to not keep those results for scientists and really uh, bring it to uh, all of you guys. Thanks for listening. Wow, thank you everyone for this very important uh, conversation and presentation and this uh, research that uh, you conducted, but I think it's very important. And I think it's also very important to inform parents because especially in the first years of your baby and you know you leave the ICU, perhaps your child doesn't have the main morbidities and you think you're out of the woods, how important it is to continue that follow-up with pediatrics for uh, an adult life. And our, uh, this approach of the life course, I think is so important. So thank you all for that information. I want to share here a comment from Ashley. Uh, Ashley is almost 38. She was born at 24 weeks. She had BPD, uh, non smoker, but exposed to secondhand smoke. I am going through testing to check my lungs since I have mild issues, but had initial testing showing nothing. I was born with a vitamin D deficiency and given supplements. I also had an eating disorder in my teens, 20s, and have os osteopenia and osteoporosis, but I don't know if it was related to being born early or the eating disorder. I was followed by, uh, I followed my NICU program until I was 16, thankfully, my family doctor, I think it interrupted here the comments. Um, but thank you, Ashley, for um, sharing your story. I think it is, is so important for us to see how um, crucial it is for that follow-up. But I, I have a question to Camille first. Camille, as an adult now, how would you like to be informed about possibilities of having certain conditions and be followed up? Um, <clears throat> I, I think that um, something that I, I would like and also something that uh, other people in the cohort have told me, uh, because I'm also doing a project of uh, asking them uh, how they would like to receive this information, because we don't want to scare people. So um, the people that they actually would like their uh, healthcare providers to uh, give them this information. Uh, they, there are some frustration of uh, going to the doctor and uh, not knowing if your, your doctor is able to tell you what is related to preterm birth and what isn't. Uh, some people have told me they have bad experience because the doctor would put everything on the back of a preterm birth and some other it's the opposite. So the doctor doesn't know that there's any link uh, between the health issue and preterm birth uh, when, when there could be. So uh, I, I think just the um, uh, healthcare provider needs to needs to know this and be aware and just uh, implement this in, in the practice. So we, we ask people, uh, are you smoking? We could ask people, are you, were you very small when you were born or something like that? And, um, and also I, I think it's something that the, maybe the, the uh, pediatric hospitals could have a page on their website to inform the young adults uh, about uh, long-term outcomes because the parents, they can go on there to, to see what's going to happen to my child, but they, only during childhood uh, or when, the, when it, it's a baby. But then afterwards, you don't have, well, my parents, they, they never receive any information and it was, it was stressful. They, they never knew, like uh, they would receive a recruitment letter for something like a study on uh, uh, um, like crime rates or something like this. So uh, they were wondering like, uh, did we uh, spend like three months in the hospital and we saved her and then she's going to end up in prison? Like, so <laughs> they, they would have loved to have uh, like just clear information on, on the, the risk uh, yeah, for health and uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So we have uh, um, uh, 
we have quite a few questions here. Uh, Juliette, who should, could be responsible for the annual checkups? So I think both family physician and pediatricians um, are, are well trained to do annual checkup. It's in terms of um, you no know, for blood pressure for checking glucose. There are actual there are guidelines for people who are, for example, overweight. Uh, for certain uh, people who receive uh, certain types of medication, for example, steroids. The problem right now is that there are no formal recommendation for children or adults who are born prematurely. So the the, doc, the physicians don't we know, and this is really like our goal. Um, for me and Anne Monique and for all the researchers to really inform family physicians and pediatricians. But um, but otherwise, like the tests that are required are not very difficult to do. It's really like the basics. And if the person has uh, and, and you know, if the person has pulmonary uh, symptoms, respiratory symptoms, it's not very complicated to to order pulmonary function tests to make sure that you know everything uh, is fine and to make some counseling regarding uh, smoking cessation or avoiding any exposure that could increase uh, inflammation in the lungs. So really like in any um, uh, healthcare, like primary care provider is well trained uh, to do this, but maybe they're not well informed. And, and I think, um, no, I, I think that, you know, nowadays how it has changed is the partnership with patient is more and more important, at least like in, in the pediatric setting. So I think that if also parents or patient themselves say, hey, like there has been research on premature prematurity and long term outcomes. Uh, what do you think? Do you think I should have a general checkup? Because, you no, know, that it's not complicated to to order, those are not invasive tests. And most important, there's something that can be do and they know how to treat hypertension. It's it's the same treatment as anybody who would have hypertension. Okay, but I have a question for you because uh, once last week we did a talk on preeclampsia because it's a, it's a preeclampsia awareness month. And you mentioned uh, the, the mothers, uh, mothers to be who are born preterm are a higher risk of uh, preeclampsia. And when I look at the checklist, who is at higher risk, there is no preterm if you were born preterm. So I think we still have some work to do there because it, we cover the basics, right? But preterm, I often see out of the picture in a lot of uh, different settings. I totally agree with you, uh, Fabiana. That's really a low-hanging fruit because... Uh, uh, the rate of preeclampsia and gestational diabetes is twice as high in ladies who were born less than 32 weeks themselves. Therefore, it's obvious that they need to be aware of themselves and the obstetricians need to pay special attention to their pregnancies. So yeah, that's something we're already working on and you'll help us to get it through. We have a lot of work to do, but I think together we can do much better. We yeah. have more questions come here from Daniela. Is there a standardization level of practice in terms of how long we could have follow-up? Thank you, Daniela. So I think in terms of follow-up, there's different types of follow-up. So the, the one that we know that has been really standardized is the neonatal follow-up programs across Canada. And, um, and depending on the resources in each follow-up programs, you know, we... There's a standardized 18-month visit, but we're hoping that, you know, more and more clinics go above the 18-month visit and follow the children up until school, really to accompany families, because what we're realizing is that teachers are not so aware of, um, of the challenges that some premature babies can have, and even like some pediatrician or family doctors may not feel very comfortable. So I think that there's the, the more like neurodevelopmental educational follow-up, which should last at, at least until um, entry at school. But unfortunately, it really depends on the resources locally in the hospital, how the neonatal follow-up program is, is set up. But, um, but I know like in the Toronto area or the Quebec area, most clinics will go up until five to seven years of age. Then the, the, the rest of the follow-up that we're talking about, more for the general health, I think this is lifelong because it's not, uh, as we said, it's not, you know, it doesn't require skills like, you know, special skills in developmental behavioral pediatrics, for example. It, it's really, you know, taking the blood pressure, looking at symptoms. This is basic medicine and it, it's, 
an annual checkup. Um, so um, I would advocate for lifelong, but I do agree that right now, and I was talking to that last week with Fabiana, but in certain province, um, person who don't have risk factors, it's not like the, the doctors don't get paid for the annual checkup anymore, which I think is, is a little bit counterintuitive. Um, so this is why I think there is some work to do to say that, hey, this is a special a group which might require more follow-up. Uh, and so they should have access to annual uh, follow-up. I, I don't think it's all the province that don't reimburse for annual checkup, but certain do, and we definitely need to work on that. Absolutely. So we have a question here from Juliette. Juliette is uh, ex-Prem. She's in the Netherlands. Thank you for the presentation. Very interesting. Some questions from a former preemie, 28 weeks in 1980. Did you find a difference between the groups, preterm versus term, in how often they exercise endurance sports, intermittent action sports, strength training? And was this possible to relate to this to your results of observing a lower exercise tolerance in preterm group? Did you search into pulmonary hypertension? It is observed in PREMS. Uh, okay, I have to look at the rest of the question because it's cut off here. But I think you can start answering those questions. I don't know if that's going to go to Dr. Nui or uh, Dr. Lu. Well, um, I'll, I'll start maybe and uh, Dr. Lu can complete. Um, yeah, for exercise um, endurance or tolerance, indeed, it was a little lower. Uh, but uh, the... Um, uh, some studies find that uh, adults born preterm exercise less often or less um, with, with less uh, force. But in our study, it wasn't that obvious that the, the group of individuals born preterm were exercising less. Um, so we're still uh, trying to understand, is it, are they... Um, not exercising as much or feeling less endurance for tolerance for their exercise because I don't know as children were they um, overprotected by pa their parents um, that's one thing that many uh, of our um, participants in the cohort told us is it because they they feel out of breath is it because their muscles are getting tired more often this these are things that were trying to understand, but for sure they, they can exercise and they can um, improve their health with uh, exercise. Uh, regarding uh, pulmonary hypertension, there are studies that are starting to um, come out in the literature, finding indeed there are signs of higher pulmonary um, blood pressure in the lungs, so pulmonary hypertension. Yeah, uh, we're not, the current state of knowledge does not allow us to say that we need to systematically uh, look for this, as uh, we know it is a case for higher blood pressure. For sure, we need to uh, search it uh, regularly every year, as Dr. Lu said, but for pulmonary hypertension, we're not there yet. But if somebody has clear um, uh, symptoms, I think that is something that should be part of the uh, test that could be done. I am, I'm sure Dr. Lou might want to add something. Yeah. Actually, for the exercise, I think what studies have shown is if we ask the participant or the, the preterm will actually report less physical activity, but if we put an actigraph, which is a device which will actually be measuring exercise, they do the same amount of exercise. Now, it's a very good question to whether it's, you know, the same type of exercise. Maybe it's not, but I don't think it explains all, I don't think it's just a reason of physical inactivity or more sedentary time that explains the lower, um, the lower exercise tolerance. So it, it might explain a little bit for certain patients, but it doesn't explain the whole picture. Okay, so the continuation of her question that was cut off on my screen is, did you also perform the body box measurement to observe the airway resistance in lungs next to spirometry? She's adding a nice fact. In the Netherlands, we have since end of 2019, a newly established outpatient clinic, especially for adult born preterm who are mechanically ventilated as a baby. Some of these adults born preterm are misdiagnosed as having asthma and are receiving the correct diagnosis of having BPD. 
and are receiving now the proper health care, including medication. I was previously being diagnosed from age 25 to 40 uh, as difficult to treat asthma. And since mid-July 2020, I received a proper diagnosis of having BPD. Initially, I was diagnosed with severe BPD as a baby in, two, in 1980. So thank you, Juliette, for sharing that with us. I think uh, it's a very important work that is being done in the Netherlands to have this uh, clinic really designed to see uh, preterm babies were ventilated. Can, can she share the name of the clinic? We can contact them. Yes, Juliette, can you please share on the chat uh, and then I can share here. So in the meantime, I have another question here from Diana. Diana, thank you for joining us. So is this something we should be discussing with our family practitioners who are not, not familiar with preterm birth? My daughter is 13 and a former 25-weeker. She had the pediatrician who specialized in preterm birth until she was two and now a general family doctor. Are there literature that our family practitioners can be given? So um, what I can share with uh, maybe um, Fabiana is we wrote an article for family doctors. It was five years ago, but I think the main message is still the same five years later. It was published in the Canadian Medical Association Journal. And uh, maybe it's easier if I, uh, I share it with uh, Fabiana that could and it could be put on the website. Absolutely. We can share uh, here on the chat the link, but also I can make available on our website because I think there is a lot of interest in that. And also it's a very important piece of information we can share with our uh, practitioners in the community. Um, so Juliette said she will share uh, the name of the clinic. And I also want to share here the link to the research. So you have a Facebook group. Maybe you can talk a little bit about the Facebook group for the HAPPY study. Camille, she's the Facebook master. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, so th this, is, uh, this was originally a Facebook group that would uh, um, regroup all the participants to the HAPPY study. But then uh, it grew, and now the, also the, the family of those people and other people who did not participate, uh, whether because they were living too far or they, they did not qualify for the recruitment, uh, they, they also follow our, play, our page. Uh, for, for now, it's in French, but we, try to, uh, we, we want to try to publish more on, on the page and have a um, little um, uh, explanation when we publish a, a new paper from the cohort. Uh, we, we try to explain uh, what we found and not only give the, the, the link to the scientific paper that can be difficult to, uh, to, to read for, uh, for people. So, so yeah, it's a, it, it's a page that we use uh, to, to keep people informed on uh, the results of the study. Um, and when we, when we need to, to ask people their opinion about, uh, about the research, we can also use this platform to do so. so. That is wonderful. So I have here, I also share on our comments now the link that Dr. Lu sent to us about the, the publication. And I also want to share here, if I find back, because we have a lot of comments here. Uh, so Juliette shared Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. So I think this is a great um, uh, place for us to look at and maybe follow in Canada. I don't think you have anything similar in Canada, do we, Dr. Nui? Actually, we tried uh, in Montreal to have a partnership with uh, an adult hospital. Uh, but interestingly, uh, patients we referred did not show up. <laughs> so maybe at that time, we were not very good also at, you know, explaining to um, are, uh, to the young adults why it was important uh, to go and to attend. So maybe like if, um, you know, if we are discussing that again with our patient partnership group and with, um, with internists to see how we can actually make this work better, um, that will be a, a better success, you know, a couple of years later. But we'll probably contact those uh, people in the Netherlands to see how they have been uh, doing their clinic because, uh, because I think it's very important to have. Absolutely. And I know Juliette is very involved in their work in the Netherlands. So here is a comment from Juliette Lee. 
Uh, I think Juliette is in England. I am involved with developing the Adult Premium Advocacy Network. How can we grow in this community? Uh, thank you, Juliette. Uh, and I will also share the link in the meantime. So maybe Camille can give some insights on how can we grow this community among the premiers. Um, yeah, so um, one, one thing that we did is uh, we, I, I tried to uh, talk to the participants when they come for the, for the studies because I was there on the, we have a, another cohort following the happy cohort that we, we call the also young adults that were born uh, preterm. And so when I was there uh, uh, doing the test and talking with them, I would introduce them, uh, tell them we have a, a Facebook page. And I think through research with the people that we recruited, we can, uh, we can start to, to, um, to give some information about this platform. And uh, many of them, they were, uh, they were grateful because it's not something that you can see uh, like it, it, it's uh, something that happened a long time ago. And often you can have people in your community that were born preterm and you will not know because uh, they will not tell you or they feel like it's more of their parents' uh, story. So uh, many of them were uh, enthusiastic to have a, a community like this. Um, <clears throat> and also we used, uh, we used um, the recruitment uh, list uh, for the study, but we also use uh, those lists to, to send information. So uh, to tell them we have a, a Facebook page and invite them to, to go check, uh, check this because maybe, maybe they are not able to come uh, participate in the study, but they will st still want to uh, be informed. And maybe sometime we, uh, what happened, we do uh, another study that is only online with a survey and then they can participate. So. <laughs> Camille, one last message if the parents are watching us and they still have young children, young premiers, like I do, a nine-year-old, and sometimes it's very hard for us to see what the futures hold for our babies. And I always feel when I talk to adults who are born preemie, it means hope to me, hope that the future is great, no matter how your birth circumstance or how many months you spend in ICU, but I see a lot of premiums active in the community, contribute to the community, unlike what sometimes the media portrays our babies to be and how uh, they grow. So I think you are such a beautiful example of uh, you know the, 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 your life, really, and giving back to this community to doing the work that you do today. So one message for parents in our, on our audience today. So uh, one thing that I, I think is very important is to, to just believe in your child and remember that they, they are very strong because they, they went through all of this. Um, so, so sometimes I think their parents, they want to be overprotective, but uh, the, the child is strong and they're, they're going to, you know, you cannot protect them from everything. And sometimes they're going to get hurt, but they, they will get back, back on track because, uh, you know, they, they yeah. They, they are very strong and I find that what happens when they, when they grow older is that, uh, you know, they, they have a gratitude for life because they know they've been given a second chance. And I think it, it make, makes us maybe want to, to do uh, things like, uh, like giving back and uh, yeah. So. <laughs> wow, that is beautiful. Camille. I'm going to share a very beautiful message for you today. I find that learning how to proactively help our preemie to be very empowering. This presentation has great information and we have found some helpful tips and reassurance as preemie parents. I remember reading about Camille during our NICU days and her story gave us hope. It's uh, wonderful to see her doing this work to help the next generation. Thank you. Thank you, Loni, for sharing that with us. And that's exactly how I feel, like is the hope, like, Sometimes you don't see that in front of us when you are facing challenges, when your babies are so little and facing uh, the imaginable. So you are hope for all of us. So thank you. Uh, Dr. Louis, Dr. Lou, any final thoughts and comments and messages to our uh, parents, uh, perhaps to our other adults who are listening to us today? I, I think just... Kemi summarized it well. I have the privilege to follow families as a pediatrician. And, and really, look, like when you speak to the young, to the, the teens, they're like, whoa, this is my parents' story. Like, uh, 
I'm doing just fine. And I was speaking to a mom earlier on and she was like, my son, they're doing the competition of who has the biggest scar. And you know, they're proud of their scars. And she's like, they don't remember obviously what it meant for me, but actually this is your story as a parent. And I think it's, it's great, but you have to trust your kid. They're so resilient, they're so strong. They're actually teaching us how to be better persons, I think. Absolutely. And I'm going to share here a comment from Sarah. Uh, thank you so much. This is what premier parents need to hear. And I 100% agree. And I'm just going to say hi from Zimbabwe. Francis online. So he usually joins our lives on Fridays. Dr. Nui, one last thought. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you for inviting us. And I think we need to continue doing research to improve the care we do in the NICU and long after. And I also um, think it's very important to um, give uh, our children born preterm the uh, tools to advocate for themselves, because as Camille said, they're very strong. So we have to give them the baton for them to go on in life, taking care of themselves. Absolutely. Thank you so much, the three of you, for joining us here today. I am so grateful. I use, I love to end the week with this beautiful messages with hope for the future, hope for the next generations. And I applaud all the three of you for the work that you do for this community. It's truly inspiring and does inspire me as a parent, leading a parent organization to continue to do this work. You know, some days are hard. Some days we work alone and we struggle. But to see that there's so many of you doing this amazing work, all we can do as parents to join force with you so you can see better outcomes for future generations. So thank you all of you for this beautiful uh, presentation today. And for all of you uh, watching us at home, either uh, from YouTube or uh, Facebook, thank you so much for joining us from so, so many different countries today. I'm very grateful. Uh, I know you're in different time zones, so it's very great to have you all here. And all the, the video from today's presentation and all the videos from all the other sessions we've done are available on our website. And I'm going to share the link here with you, which is the CanadianPremies.org. I want to thank our sponsors, AbV and Water Wipes, for their ongoing support for our education sessions. And we are a charitable organization, and we believe that through education and support, we can educate and empower families so they are ready to care for their babies at home visit our website, consider making a donation. Together, we can create a brighter future for all families. So I see you next Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. Stay well, everyone.